right, good morning. Good to see everyone. I pray that you've had a good week and uh, been a been a busy week. God has sure blessed us in so many ways. I pray that you felt that and uh, you felt good about being in his house this morning. I want to read uh, some scripture verses from John chapter 1, verse 1. And I want this just to draw us in close, to get us in a spirit of worship and get us in reverence to God. And it says, in the beginning, the word already existed. We covered this in our Sunday school message just a few minutes ago in the class I was in. And then it says, the word was with God and the word was God. Speaking of, of course, Jesus. It says he existed in the beginning with God and God created everything through him. And nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. You know, if we walked into this room and it was totally dark, if it was at night, and you turned on one light, or you lit one match, and maybe you lit up one candle, you can imagine how much light would be shared. But at the same time, if I'm a dark person and I walk into this room that's full of light, maybe I'm filled with evil and the devil, but I can't extinguish any light because the light is so powerful. I'm going to ask you to stand as we open in a word of prayer. And as we have become accustomed, let's raise our hands to our Lord. Father God, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the beauty of it, for the ability for us to be in your house, Lord, with like-minded folks. We pray that we will smile and laugh and giggle and be encouraged by each one being here. But at the same time, there is a seriousness. There is a seriousness to draw close to you right now. In these few fading moments, dear God, I pray that as we breathe slowly, we'll just let down all concern, all worries, all troubles. We'll focus upon you that we will prepare our hearts for worship. And then by doing so, we will feel your Holy Spirit all around us. We pray that you will touch us, Lord, change us, make us greater than we have been this week. Put our respect, our reverence, and our love to you. And as we do that, then we will love our fellow man as ourselves. Guide us, Lord. We give our message to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I might even let you take it home with you. Well, we've got a sign here. Everybody see this? You hold it now? It says he got up and he's coming back. Well, we just sung about, tell me the story of Jesus. Do you all know about Jesus? Hmm? You know Jesus was God's son? He was sent here to save us from our sins. And I think that's wonderful, and I think we know that, and I bet you that mamas and daddies and grandpas and grandmas tell you about that and read you stories and read you uh books of the Bible that tells you what Jesus has done for us. But I think sometimes we, like children and grown-ups, we forget of his promise. His promise was this, not only to come here and meet our needs and save us from our sins, but he's coming back. And I think we take that for granted. How many of you got up this morning and looked towards the eastern sky and said, I wonder if today is the day? Well, it could be. We're not assured of another day, but we are assured in accordance to God's promises that Jesus is coming back. So, Brother David Ross brought these to us today, and we've got a few extra ones up here. So if you'd like to get one before you leave today to put in your yard or place of business, get one of these signs because it helps to remind us that Jesus is coming back one day, and that should be exciting to us. Amen? All right. Can you say amen? I hear it sometimes when I'm praying, you say amen from back there. <laughs> All right. You want to pray together? 
We're together. You ready? All right, let's close our eyes and pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for these children. We thank you through the simpleness of minds like a child. It's through that simple calling of you, Lord, that we come to be children of you, dear God. And we thank you that their moms and dads, their grandpas and grandmas and others, share with them what you're doing all around them each and every day, that they too can come to know you as Savior, Lord. We pray that we would not only allow them to learn from us, but we will learn from them as well as to how important it is to serve you. And although some days it's difficult, it is pretty simple that we just trust you, Lord. We put our faith into you, and we know that you are coming back one day. We don't know the time, but we pray that we'll all be ready. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, it felt good to do that again. Amen? Amen. Well, we just pray that... Uh, that God's got a great handle on all the things that's going on around us. We know that the pandemic has uh, controlled a lot of things in our lives, but yet we still want to make good decisions. We still want to be careful and, and do those things that we need to protect the health of everyone, not just us, ourselves. We've got to look out for everyone. So uh, we'll continue to do that again uh, unless something gets stirred up, and uh, then we'll take precautions at that time. But um, I thank you for being here this morning. You're probably wondering why I'm not speaking this morning. Well, we've taken, uh, my daughter calls it a staycation, all right? We're, we're doing some things together, but we're staying home and doing it. Uh, they came in on Friday, and uh, we're excited to have them, and uh, they've kept us busy. We've, we've been, uh, we went to shoot some skeet one day. Yesterday, we went bowling and uh, had some good food. We probably ate too much, and uh, tomorrow we're going fishing. If we catch anything, we're going to clean the fish and fry them up and enjoy our time together. And we hope to, hope to do uh, some things before they go back on Tuesday. So uh, David uh, Ross was gracious enough to come and speak today. And, and I know without a doubt that God's going to bless what he's got to share with us. So we want to become a more mission-minded church. Amen? And we want to look for ways that we can help others. And I'll just go on and tell you, you guys have been great in your giving. The finances has been great even through the pandemic. So we need to use those finances. We don't want to build a great pot of, of savings, okay? We want to bless others with what God is blessing us with. So if you have a, a, a challenge that God has given you in areas that we may help others, we need to know about it. And we need to work towards those missions. There's a few that God has blessed us with and called us to, but there may be many, many more because we must realize each and every day that there's not, not thousands and not millions, but billions of people that don't know Jesus as Savior. And that's what we're called to do. So I thank you for giving me the liberty to kind of be at home but be away a few days. I've had a great week. I went down and spent a couple days with Tom at Lumberton uh, cooking meals for those that are helping out with the disaster relief down there. And I would tell you that those folks down there are still hurting. There's still a lot of areas affected by flooding. There's still those that, that need their homes refurbished. They need new roofs put on. They need new plumbing. Um, it's amazing that even after three years, there's still a lot of work to be done down there. So I assure you that the Baptist men and the Baptist on mission down there are still doing a great work. So pray for them each and every day. And Tom, I had a good time. I was afraid I was going to get here and there was going to be pictures scrolling through of what I was doing this week because every once in a while I look around, Tom would be snapping a photo of, of how busy we were and the things we were doing. But we got up early. 4.30 in the morning, and I had to sleep between two grizzly bears snoring, so I didn't get much sleep, but we had a great time, uh, but we get up at 4.30 in the morning, we cook, we got those, those troops off, and there was 78 of them there a couple of times, and then we go back and get in the bed again, because <laughs> we were so tired, but we had a great time, we had a great time. Good morning. Thank you for the privilege of being back home with y'all again. I do feel like I've come home when I've been here. I just wish I could come home more often. Uh, but my duties as AMS won't allow me to do that. I love being the AMS of Anson Baptist Association. 
But I do miss being able to be more active in, in a local church. And this is such a wonderful and awesome, loving and generous church. It's a privilege to be a part of you. And I'm glad to be here today. I do I remind you about those signs, those stakes, to stick them in your yard or right there behind the cross with them as well? Please take them with you. They are free. We have more at the office. Feel free to take one to a friend. If you want two in your yard, uh, please take them. And if you run out and want some more, come by the office or call me. We'll we'll hook you up. This morning, in just a moment, we'll be looking at Exodus chapter 3 is where we'll start. We'll be mostly in Exodus chapter 3 and 4. And I want to tell you how excited I am about your Wednesday night meeting starting back because that'll give me one more opportunity to, to pop in on occasion during a month. So I'm excited looking forward to those Wednesday nights. Before you get to Exodus 3 and tell you a little story, uh, first let me ask a question. Have you ever been reluctant to do something somebody asked you to do? Maybe you didn't feel like you were quite good enough. Maybe you didn't feel like you had the experience to do it, and so you really didn't want to do it. In our text for today, we'll read about a, a guy in the Bible that felt very much that way when God called him and wanted him to do something that was bigger than what he wanted to take on by himself. Let me share this story with you first. Another person had that feeling too. A hospital administrator was uh, walking down the hall in between some of the surgery units and out of one of the operating rooms burst this patient. He's running down the hall toward the administrator. The administrator stops him. The man's gown was flapping in the wind behind him. He was obviously upset. He stops him and says, you know, uh, what's wrong? Why are you running? He said, well, I was in the operating room. He says, I understand. What upset you? He said, well, it was the nurse, something the nurse said. Well, what did the nurse say? She said, it's just a simple ac ac appendectomy. I can't say it, but the doctor could. And <clears throat> the administrator said, well, what's wrong with that? You know, so what? It, it is a simple procedure. I would have thought that that would have made you feel more comfortable. And the patient said, but the nurse wasn't talking to me. She was talking to the doctor. They, that doctor maybe didn't have the experience, maybe had done one of those before, and he just wasn't quite ready yet. Kind of like, kind of like Moses in the Bible. Moses in the Bible was, was off in the wilderness taking care of his father-in-law's sheep there on, on Mount Hor, Mount Sinai. And he had this experience while he was there. He, he saw a bush, and there was fire in the bush, but the bush wasn't burning up. And that really got his curiosity up. See, a fire to start off with, and the one that was unusual in the sense that the bush wasn't burning up, so he decided he wanted to have a closer look. And so he gets closer to that burning bush, and then the voice of God speaks through an angel in the bush. I want to pick up now in Exodus chapter 3, beginning at verse 4. So when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for you are standing on holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of the taskmaster and their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. We'll stop there for the moment. 
God had miraculously spared baby Moses' life after he was born and just a few months old and uh, had him adopted into the house of Pharaoh. Pharaoh's own daughter adopted baby Moses as her own son, and he grew up in the household of Pharaoh. Things went well for the first 40 years of Moses' life, but one day when he went out to see how his Hebrew brothers and sisters were getting along, he saw an Egyptian beating one of the Hebrews. And I imagine something snapped inside of Moses as he was filled and overwhelmed with anger, and he killed the Egyptian, buried his body in the sand. Then word began to spread about what happened, and he was afraid of Egyptian justice, so he fled. He ran. He left Egypt, left everything he'd known for 40 years, left it behind him, ended up in the land of Midian, and he came across a family of shepherds and ended up becoming a shepherd himself, working for his father Jethro, ended up marrying one of his daughters. And for 40 years, he took care of Jethro's sheep there in the wilderness. So Moses was as high as he could get just about in Egypt, being in the royal family. He went from that to lowly hired shepherd in just a short amount of time. So he was 40 years old, left Egypt when he was 40. Now he spent another 40 years in the wilderness. Now he's 80 years old. And he sees this burning bush. And God comes to him and speaks to him in verse 10, saying, Come now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God had a job for Moses to do. He was calling him to join with God in doing a great task, doing a great thing, setting the people of Israel free from Egyptian slavery. Now, God still calls his people to join him in the task of making a difference in this world. He doesn't just call people like Moses. He calls every believer, every Christian, every Christian here, everyone who's listening over uh, the internet, God calls every believer to be on mission with him, be part of his team to make a difference in this world, to help those that are in need, to share the gospel to those who've never had it. God calls everyone, every believer to follow him and to be on his make a difference team. Consider Jeremiah 29, 11, where God says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, plans to give you a future and a hope. God told Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. God said to Jeremiah that before you were born, I had a plan for your life. I don't believe that was just for Jeremiah. I think God has a plan for every one of our lives, my life, your life, every one of our lives. For some, it's to be a preacher. For some, it's to be a prophet like Jeremiah. For some, it's to be a school teacher. For some, it might be a, a truck driver. But the point is, God calls each one of us to be on mission for him wherever he's placed us starting in our homes, including our jobs, including our neighborhood. We're to be on mission for God wherever he has called us and placed us and planted us. We're to serve him there and be willing to go wherever he sends us because he's God. After testifying that God has saved us by grace through faith, Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Part of God's plan for you is to do good works. God has created and saved and called you to be part of his do good, make a difference team to change the world. If you want to call God's team, you could call in an army, use that figure of speech. In God's army, there are no drafted people. They're all volunteers. It's an all-volunteer army in God's army. Nobody's forced to become a Christian. Nobody's forced to believe in God. Nobody's forced to obey God. It's our choice to obey him or not. But of course, 
we receive the results of that, good and bad, whether we choose according to how we choose. God's army is a volunteer army, but too many Christians are A-W-O-L, that means absent without leave. I don't know where they are. We've got all these names on our church rolls, but where are they? To many of those names that are not in church or not in anybody's church, they're not serving God anywhere. They're just home doing their own thing, going their own way, and wasting their life in many instances. We are in a spiritual war today. The old devil, as we were reading in Sunday school this morning, is, is on the prowl looking for whom he can destroy. The devil is destroying lives and enslaving them in sin and suffering. And God is calling Christians to stand up as all hands on deck to share the good news of Jesus Christ, to help those that are hurting. The devil is devouring our children today. They need to know what's right and what's wrong. They need to hear the truth of the gospel because they're not going to hear it in their schools. They're not going to hear it on the radio and the music they're listening to. They need to hear it from us Christians or they won't hear it at all. God is calling every one of us to duty. The needs are so great, the opportunities are equally great. Too many Christians are making excuses like Moses. And be honest, if I had been in Moses' shoes, I'd probably been making excuses too. We make too many excuses. Think about Moses' excuses. Now, I admit Moses was a very good excuse maker. He was good at it, but it, it didn't work with God. It never works with God. Look at his excuses. The first one you'll see in in, uh, verse 11 of chapter 3. Moses says, who am I to go to Pharaoh? In other words, God, I'm not good enough to go and talk to that important king. Who am I to go? I'm not good enough. But what does God say in the next verse, verse 12? I will certainly be with you. As Casey so beautifully sang in the song about God being with us, this is a reminder that God promises that when he sends us to be on mission for him, that he'll go with us. We will never do his mission alone. We're trying to do it alone. We're not doing his work. We're doing our work. We've got to do it with him. He promises, I will certainly be with you. I love that promise. In verse 13, Moses says, but God, I don't know your name. And if they ask me your name, I won't know what to tell them. So God says, Say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am. We translate it Jehovah or Yahweh today. It's God's special name. He goes on to say, to tell them that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God told Moses what he needed to do. His third excuse. But Lord, what if they don't believe me? And what if they don't listen to me? God says, what do you have in your hand? Well, I've got a staff. You know, the shepherd's staff is what he had in his hand. God said, throw it down. Moses threw it down. It turned into a snake. God said, grab the snake. And I had a real problem at that point. The only way I want to get close to a snake is at the end of a hoe. <clears throat> but Moses grabbed the snake, and it turned back into a staff. God said, take your hand and, and put it in your bosom. He took it in there and pulled it out, and it was white with leprosy. God said, do it again. He did it again, and it was gone, healed whole again. And God said, if they don't listen to the first sign or the second sign, here's the third sign. Go to the Nile, get some water, pour it out on the dirt. And God said, the dirt, the water that you pour in the dirt will turn to blood. Three ways of helping them to see that God was miraculously at work and that Moses was indeed sent by God. Again, God said, I'm with you. I will help you. And this is some of the ways I will help you. So, so far, we've looked at three excuses of Moses, the fourth one. Moses says in chapter 4, verse 10, basically he says, well, let's read it. Chapter 4, verse 10. Then Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since. You have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Basically he's saying, God, I can't talk well in front of people. I don't talk well. I don't communicate well. God, I'm I'm not the right one for the job. That's what he's saying. What does God say? Verse 11. So the Lord said to him, 
Who is man's? Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth. I will be with your mouth and teach you what to say. Again, God says, I'll be with you and tell you what to say. God promised to be with Moses. God promised to give Moses what he needed to get the job that God had called him to do done. I will certainly be with you, he promised in verse 12. If God calls you to do something, if God calls you to go somewhere, if God calls you to a ministry, to a task, to a job, God will help you do it and provide what you need to do it. My allergies are working on me this morning. Excuse my voice. God will go with you. If God calls you to teach a group of rowdy teenagers in a Sunday school class, God will go with you. If God calls you to witness to your neighbor across the street, God will go with you. If God calls you to invite your co-worker to come to church where they can hear the gospel, God will go with you. If God calls you to be a church planner right here in our great country of the USA, God will go with you. If God calls you to go to China or the Soviet Union or some far off place to be a missionary, God will go with you. He will be with you and help you to do the work he's called you to do. You will not go alone if God has called you. Many times, God will provide for the need. But God doesn't always provide it when you want it. God has his own timetable, doesn't he? If God's called you, he will provide it. But he doesn't often give it to you early. Many times it's right when you need it is when God provides it, then he'll give it to you. So it takes that faith. I think God wants to grow our faith and our trust in him sometimes to make us really wait so that when we do get it, we know that it was a God thing. God did it. And this is God's work. I want us to pause just for a moment and really think about who it is that's calling us to be on mission with him. Who is God? Great of the world, the sustainer of life. We still live today because God created us first and he keeps it all working. He's the one who who set the sun on fire and the stars in the sky. He made it all. He is the one who appeared to Moses and part of the Red Sea and did all the miracles we read about in the Bible. He's the one who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to leave heaven, to come to earth, to die on the cross for my sin and your sin. Then God the Father raised him from the dead. And he's alive today to save anyone, anyone, anyone who will believe in him and trust him and turn from their sin and place their faith in him. That's the greatest gift of love God ever gave us, was his own son to save us. It is this God Almighty, infinite in knowledge and might and power, who says, I will be with you. It is God Almighty who says, I have a job for you. Many times, we want a God that's more like a genie, that will answer answer our wishes, that will go with us and help us to accomplish what we want to do. God's bigger than us. He's, He's not our lap boy. He's not our servant. He's God Almighty. We're his servants. We're his children. And so we are to serve him. It's not up to him to serve us. Sometimes we put it backwards and we want God to be all about what we're all about. But many times what we're all about is us. We want to improve our life. We want more riches or pleasures or whatever. Fame, fortune. That's usually what a lot of people are about. What's God about? Saving the lost. Helping the hurting. Making the world a better place. Being a part of what God's doing is so much more important and so much more rewarding than anything we would be about without him. When we go our own way, do our own thing, look for our own pleasures and power and and privilege, it leaves us not fulfilled. It leaves us broken and empty. But we go with God, denying ourselves power and privilege and all those other things, but follow God regardless of the sacrifice, we find a peace We find a completeness. We find a fullness in serving God that we cannot find anywhere else. 
Those of you who have served God know that. God called Moses to serve him and promised to go with him and to help him accomplish the work of God. Look at verse 13 to see Moses' first response to God's call. At verse 13, Moses at first says, Oh my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. In other words, God, that's great, God. It's a great plan. I wish you would send somebody else to do it. In other words, God, I don't want to do it. Send somebody else, God. I don't want to do it. That's what he's really saying. That's the wrong response. Why? Well, it's either selfish because he doesn't want to give up his life that he already has, or it's, a, it's an answer that lacks faith. He's not trusting God to do what God said he was going to do, and he's not trusting God to provide whatever would be needed in order to accomplish the setting free of the people of Israel. So either he's selfish and don't want to do it, or he's not trusting God at this point. Aren't we like that sometimes too? We either we say no to God because either we don't want to do it, we don't want to make the sacrifice, we'd rather sit at home and watch TV or do our own thing or go to the lake or do whatever instead of doing what God calls us to do. Or sometimes we just don't have the faith. We don't trust God can do it, especially through us. I feel that way sometimes, honestly. Sometimes I feel... You know, I'm not good enough for God to use me in, in the powerful way that he needs to use somebody. Do you feel that way sometimes? I think we all do. But you know what gives me comfort? It gives me comfort is that story in the Old Testament where God uses that donkey to speak to Balaam. If God can use an old donkey, he can use an old bald-headed preacher. Now that, that gives me encouragement. So God can use you too. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to have a seminary degree. God can use you. In fact, you have unique gifts and abilities that you have that other people may not have. Some can sing, some can preach. <clears throat> some are good on computers. Some can fix cars. You know, there are times when having a car fixed is a God thing because you can't do God's work in this particular way unless you got a way to get there or, or carry people to where they need to go. So God can use everybody. God can use everybody. And all of these skills and abilities there are things God can use for his kingdom too, even though it may not necessarily be something you often associate with Christianity. If it's a skill and you give it to God the Father, he can use it and bless it for his kingdom. God was angry with Moses in verse 14 at first, and my friend, that's a dangerous place to be, to have God angry at you. The all-powerful, all-knowing, almighty God angry with you, I don't want to be there. God went on to tell Moses, It's not Aaron the Levite, your brother. I know that he can speak well. Look, he's coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he'll be clad in heart. Verse 15 of chapter 4. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. I will be with you in your mouth and with his mouth. And I will teach you what you shall do. In the end, God met Moses' need for help and promised again that he would be with him and that he would be with Aaron help them bring the people out of Egypt. You know how the story goes. Despite Moses' hesitancy, he does obey God. He does go. God uses him in a mighty way and delivers the people of Israel out of Egypt. It's been over 3,000 years since God appeared to Moses at the burning bush and brought the people of Israel out of Egypt. But we're still talking about Moses and how God used Moses because Moses obeyed God. When you trust God and you obey him, God will do great things through that. I'm not going to promise you that people will still be talking about you 3,000 years from now, but I am promising that God will bless it and use you if you will obey him and trust him and step out in faith with him. God will make you a blessing to somebody else and bless your life in the doing as well. Look at verse 12 of chapter 4. Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. God said, go. He didn't say sit. He didn't say stay. He didn't say, you sit there and wait for Pharaoh to come out in the wilderness and meet you while you're taking care of the sheep. It's not what God said. He didn't say, you stay there, and meanwhile, the elders of Israel will come and talk to you. He said, no, you go to Pharaoh, you go to the elders of Israel, you go. Too many times, we'd rather sit. But sit in the safety and comfort of our pews when God calls us to go. Great Commission calls us to go into all the world, doesn't it? 
But the truth is, if we don't go, the world will never hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Fact is, most people are not going to come to church. Most lost people will never come to church unless it's to a funeral, maybe. And a lot of them might not come then. So of the 25,000 people who live here in our county, you know, most are in church, most are lost, at least half. I'm sure it's probably more than that. And they're not going to come to church. If they're not going to come to church to hear the gospel, how are they going to hear it? We've got to take it to them. We've got to show them the love of God. We've got to show them the word of God by sharing it with them and through our actions of loving and caring for them. Remind you one more thing that God said. God said, Moses, what's that in your hand? Remember the staff that turned into the snake? And that is a reminder for me that God can take what we have our knowledge, our abilities, our skills, and God can use that for his kingdom in unique ways we never thought possible. So that means God can use you in unique ways you never thought possible if you'll just make it available to him. If you'll just bring yourself and say, Lord, I'm here. Like Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, when he says, Lord, hear my, send me. Will you say that to God this morning? Here am I, send me. I'm available, God. I don't know what you want me to do, but if you'll tell me, if you'll show me and promise to go with me, which he does, I'm here. I'm ready. God calls every one of us to service. What's he calling you to do? What's he calling you to do? What's he calling you to do? Let's pray together. Father God, Each of us are here this morning because someone shared the good news of Jesus Christ with us. Thank you, Lord, for that that one. Maybe it was a parent or a neighbor or a Sunday school teacher. Lord, somebody share with us. Lord, help us to be that somebody for someone else that we might share the love of Jesus Christ with them, to call them out of a life of sin and suffering to a great life of, of living with and for you. Father, I pray for that someone who's been struggling with the calling that you put on their life. You're calling them to do something else, Lord, but they haven't been ready. Lord, I pray today that they might fully trust you and love you with all their heart and accept the call you've placed on their life, whether it be big or small, Father. I pray the day might be that day. Lord, I pray for that one that might be who's never accepted you as Lord and Savior. Father, you love them enough to send your son and raise him from the dead to take away their sins. May they trust in the wonderful gift of Jesus and receive you as their Lord and Savior today and start living the planned life that you have for them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.